Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, can you hear me okay? The door has closed, so you can't get out. So. Yeah, right. I'm really impressed by how many of you are here choosing to be here when you could be outside playing in the sunshine. It's remarkable. Um, welcome. It's really nice to see you, and it's so nice for me to be in a lecture theatre feeling really clever because it's been a few decades since I was anywhere near any of this kind of setup learning things. So this is really, really lovely. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, my name is Nina Nanar and I am the arts editor of ITV News, uh, which I'm sure you all know because I'm sure you all watch it. 136.30 News at 10. BBC, don't worry. Right, I've marked you out. You'll be asking some, <laughs> you'll be asking some questions later on. So... Um, uh, and it's really nice being in here and to have this really important panel talking about what in my industry, and I don't, I'm going to learn a lot about the world of um, academics and universities this afternoon. My world, of course, is broadcast news and certainly the word diversity, it's, it's kind of a buzzword. It's the buzzword of the moment. It has actually been a buzzword in broadcasting for longer than a decade, but it's only in the last few years that those of us in this industry have started to analyse what it actually means, what our responsibilities are, and in fact, how much we are lacking. It has been quite a problem. It's taken sort of the likes of Lenny Henry to stand up and start shouting about it for real change to happen, for companies like Sky, the BBC, to set themselves targets. And this is not just black um, for race, this is LGBT. Um, not so much at this stage, though it is with the BBC, with people with disabilities. There's a hell of a lot, there's a hell of a long way to go. But we're kind of at that beginning stage, and the most important part of it is to start talking about it, I think, um, and having events like this. Though I have to say, when um, ITN, who I work for, decided to have a diversity day, we invited in up-and-coming broadcasters from many diverse backgrounds, and as they walked in, they were welcomed by an exhibition. And the two people on the exhibition that we chose to welcome in for our diversity day were Julie Etchingham and Tom Bradby, both not very diverse, it has to be said, you know, um, white, middle class, um, you know, uh, kind of the archetypal person who works in television broadcasting. So we are missing our mark constantly. Uh, but we're talking about it and we're getting there. Um, when I walked into ITN 16 years ago from the BBC, um, and I walked into that newsroom and I looked around and it struck me at that moment that I was in a room full of white men wearing blue shirts. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with white men <laughs> wearing blue shirts. It's a very attractive look. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I suddenly walked in there and thought, it's just me and Trevor MacDonald doing it for diversity. <laughs> That's not really a joke. I really did think, it's me and Trevor. And quite a, for quite a long time, people, they've hidden behind people like me in my industry saying, look, we've got Trevor MacDonald. You know what happens? Trevor MacDonald retired. So suddenly we had to really start looking at these things and looking at ways of improving it. And we are sort of getting there. We have a long way to go. We're only just adjust, addressing gender imbalance as well. And that is something I know at Imperial through, through DOT here that is something that you take very, very seriously. And your world is probably far more representative of the world as it is than my world, but we, we are, in fact, getting there. Diversity means lots of things. In my industry, it means... <coughs> what, what was it they said about never, never sharing the stage on screen with, uh, you know, <laughs> children or animals? They're gorgeous, though. They're very welcoming. Diversity at the stage in my career means black or white and sort of male or female. We actually count how many we have of each in every network bulletin, and then we shout at each other. But maybe if you watch News at 10 one day, you might be struck by how few women there are on there, um, apart, apart from the Julie Etchingham, who happens to be uh, presenting the bulletin when Tom's not there, of course. Not really good enough, is it? Um, uh, the ratio of... Fe male to female experts on television news is three men to every one female expert. That's not right, is it? There's plenty of female experts out there. We've got a long way to go. But diversity, as I say, comes in many, many shapes and sizes. And I feel sometimes we just go, it's a black and white issue. There's, there's an awful lot more that comes under this banner of, of diversity. And just look at that panel, ladies and gentlemen. We've got some wonderful people here who I'm sure you all know from the university who are going to talk about their experiences of diversity in the, ver the very many ways in which diversity issues really affect them and the way they work and how they are employed. So what I'm going to ask you to do, guys, is if you can just give us a, an introduction of who you are and tell us why you're here on this diversity panel today. So we'll start with you, Mark. OK, uh, well, I'm Mark Richards. Um, I teach in the physics department. Um, 
by way of um, sort of professional background, I'm an atmospheric physicist. Um, I'm on this panel because I was invited to be on it by uh, Professor Doc Griffiths. <laughs> That's the short answer. Um, <laughs> But I suppose if you want a, a bit more context, um, I, I actually did my, under, my, sorry, my PhD here um, many moons ago in the 90s. Um, and my family came over to the UK uh, from Jamaica in the 60s. I was born a few years, yep, brap. Uh, I, was born, I was born a few years later over here. And um, so when I got here to do a PhD, um, I, it was quite clear that I was the only one in my cohort of my particular background, but I'd sort of convinced myself that I was probably the first of a wave of uh, up-and-coming young uh, second-generation Jamaicans who were going to you know, eventually be here in the department. That was just my naive thought, thinking, well, naturally, it will change. Um, but, you know, ten years later or so, uh, when I returned as, or, you know, as, a, as a postdoc, I realised nothing had really changed uh, it's very hard to even find one, even now, to be honest. And so I've, I wanted to f understand a little bit more about why more people, like me, uh, can't study or, or don't seem to be studying subjects like physics at places like Imperial. And when you start to ask that question, and I suppose if I approach it a bit scientifically, you start to try and get to the root of it. And you realise, well, I realise that the root actually is not just about Imperial or its admissions process. It goes much deeper and much further, and it starts much younger. So I got involved in lots of different uh, programs, outreach activities to try and uh, uh, help inspire young people, uh, especially from my demographic, but generally uh, to, to sort of pursue, uh, pursue careers in science. And I realised that outreach is both aspirational, because you want to raise aspirations, but even once you've done that, there has to be an element of supporting preparation. So I was quite keen to get involved in programmes that actually can prepare students to actually be at places like Imperial, not just inspire them for the sake of sort of making them feel good about themselves, but actually give them some tangible things that they can do to make a difference. Uh, so that's okay. presumably why I'm here. All right, thank you much, Sharani. So I'm Sharani Sriskand and I'm an infectious diseases clinical academic and I'm based over at the Hammersmith campus, so some of you won't know me necessarily. And uh, Dot asked me to join the panel, and one of the reasons I agreed was that actually diversity issues are something that are of huge interest to me, kind of almost philosophically. I think it's really interesting. I grew up as in, in a probably the only non-white family in West Yorkshire where I live for, for miles around, and actually I had no insight into the fact I was different. Uh, I actually thought I was I was part of the local white community, and I grew up in that way oblivious to the fact that, that I was any different. Of course people saw me as different, but I didn't notice that. And it's only in retrospect, in hindsight, you look back and you think, oh, yeah, why were we always one of the three kings? We were never allowed to be Mary. Or, you know, <laughs> uh, it's just kind of really dumb things like that. And uh, um, uh, it's, just, it's just genuine stories. Um, and uh, when, I, when I kind of grew up and I, I become, became more aware of these issues, I, I did kind of begin to Actually, that's completely, completely wrong, you know, and getting lost in Woolworths and being handed over to the, the one lady in a sari who happened to be in Woolworths at the time. And, you know, the staff fe feeling very pleased with themselves that they kind of sorted out my life. I was thinking, that's not my mum. <laughs> <laughs> She's that one over there. Well, She's trying each other. to avoid me. <laughs> but pretending that she hasn't lost me. Uh, so I think, in a way, I was lucky. I grew up with a sense the same sense of entitlement that a lot of white middle class kids grew up with. I was not underprivileged. You know, we, didn't, we weren't lacking in, in money. I was lucky in that respect. And so when I went to university, I had that same aspiration that my middle class friends had as well. I didn't see myself as different. And I, I wonder whether it was because I was lucky in that way and I didn't see myself as different that somehow... I have been fortunate, but I know now that that's a very different experience for other people. Now, when I've come into the to college here, I've, I'm not aware of having been challenged because of my ethnic background, but that, again, may be my simple naivety yet again, and it may take me until retirement to look back and see the, the barriers. And I've certainly had colleagues who've said to me, oh, you know, you really should have changed your name about, you know, 30 years ago to your married name things like that, which I never did. Mm -hmm. So maybe I will look back and see the challenges, but now I'm more interested in identifying the challenges that face the people that are working with me, <coughs> our students, and I, I see huge 
sort of challenges there, exactly as you said, Mark, within the medical school, we have very, very significant underrepresentation in certain groups, especially those from the African and Caribbean descent families. So I think there's a lot of work to do in the college, uh, and I, I would really value input from everybody else here. I mean, I, I was always told to change my name, but I'm called Nina Nana, for God's sake. <laughs> so um, um, interesting, I was brought up in an area where my difference, that we're the only Asian family in town, my difference was made very obvious to me on a daily basis teachers and pupils so I did I, I have grown up feeling different it's only in the last 15 20 years when I don't feel different anymore so that it is it's you perhaps were lucky you perhaps were lucky so if we can just move along Sarah. hi um, I'm Sarah Rankin so I'm a professor in the faculty of medicine um, and one of my roles is as the lead for outreach and public engagement for my division um, so I'm here as one of the college's new dyslexia champions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a few more in the room, so great for the support, guys. And the idea behind this is that there are people within the college that can support staff and raise awareness about dyslexia and more wider about people with, that are neurodivergent is the correct terminology now for anybody that has a specific learning difficulty. Um, I grew up being dyslexic um, and because it was in the 60s I wasn't identified. So I've basically developed coping strategies to deal with dyslexia and that's what most of the people my age have done. Um, so I just would like to give you a little bit of insight into dyslexia and what it is, because I think we all have, and, and I think I did for a very long time. I've become very interested in it because my son is severely dyslexic, and um, I, yeah, so I've been, I've, as a scientist, done research into dyslexia and um, tried to make myself more knowledgeable on it for his sake. And what's interesting is that we all think of dyslexia as something, um, you know, problems with spelling, problems with writing and reading and things like that. And sure, those might be the problems, and those are the problems that are identified when you're a child, and those are the problems that make you feel stupid when you're in primary school because you're not passing the SATS test. But actually, um, dyslexia is, is much bigger than that. It's a basic problem with a, a processing, processing difference. And um, if I just give you this analogy, imagine you're starting work and you're coming into work and there's a big open plan office and you're given your desk and you can see everybody else working around you nicely on their PCs. You on the other hand are given a Mac and then you are shown by your colleagues how to do all the processes that you have to do on a PC. You then have to go back to your Mac with no IT support, because IT can only support the people on PCs. And you then have to work out how you're going to work and how you're going to be able to do your job, given that you have a Mac. Now, that creates problems. It can be quite stressful, but you develop strategies and, and ways of doing that. And it's not something that you can't get over. But... I think what the college has realised is that people sometimes need the support to be able to do that and to be able to, um, you know, have uh, work at their full potential. And I think um, the other great thing, and this is where one of my key messages, is that because you're a Mac, you know, you have got a lot of attributes and you've got a lot of strengths and you... People that are dyslexic, neurodivergent, tend to be very right-brained. So they're very creative, they're very big picture thinking, they can have vision. They are um, unconventional thinkers, think outside the box, have insight, are innovative. And all of these things, they're great problem solvers. All of these things are things that I'm looking for if I'm looking for somebody as a scientist. And I think they're all the reasons that you know, I can attribute my success. It's not, so I don't think we should look at this as a disability. I think we should just look at it as people are different and they have different attributes and they have different challenges. Okay. 
interesting. We'll talk about support structures here at Imperial a little bit later. We move on to you, Liz. Okay, so um, I'm here because I'm a carer. Um, this is a really significant day for me because I never tell anyone. So people in this room who know me will not know that I have twice have been a carer for very serious um, illnesses. And that's the point. So being a carer is back room. So it's not, I'm not ill. Um, so being a carer, people will ask how my husband is, but they don't, I'm, I'm not wanting people to ask, but it's, it's a back room um, thing. So that's not quite the right word. Um, so... On two uh, occasions, I've had two husbands. I'm not going to have a third. <laughs> I'll just live with someone if I get a third one. So, uh, it does mean you get married twice and you get two lots of engagement rings. So anyway, <laughs> sorry, just to, light, to lighten things a little bit. Um, um, so both of them were, um, came out of nowhere. Um, so the first one, so I do hope you've looked up Guillain-Barre. So Guillain-Barre is a very rare neurological disorder. And my husband was fine one day. Uh, two days later, he was virtually paralysed in hospital. Um, so very rare. Um, my second husband, so that was a physical illness, I mean, car crash out of nowhere. Second husband was mental health, that was, I came absolutely out of nowhere. Um, so um, what I am really, really good at is I'm incredibly good at crisis. So give me a crisis, any of you, and I'll roll my sleeves up. <laughs> I'm your woman, I can sort it out. <laughs> However, what it does mean is a carer, you have a background of stress. So I have this permanent stress level because I don't know what's going to happen um, and so that's had it's had a big impact on my career a um, big impact on my personality um, so those of you who do know me um, know that uh, believe it or not I used to be a little bit more patient than I am now uh, so I have very little spare capacity um, sort of emotional capacity if I'm really honest um, but I think that's why I'm here, because being a carer is the real hidden thing. I'm not ill. It's not... Oh, sorry. Mm. I'm not the one that I want the attention or the attention is focused on, but I think it's important to just remember carers and remember that the, there is this sort of underlying stress level, um, and it is, it is absolutely the hidden, uh, the hidden thing. I think, we, I think we'd all agree with that. Um, we're talking about that a lot more now, aren't we? Even at, at government level and addressing the care and attention that carers need. Um, thank you for that. And so now we move on to uh, Martha and Thomas. Oh, yes, and Dad as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nina. So, yes, I'm uh, Joe Cabral from Chemical Engineering. And uh, I th I'm, a, I'm a reader in Chemical Engineering, and I, I have had a fairly, I guess, conventional academic career. So I've, I've uh, then my undergraduate in physics, then I did my PhD here in chemical engineering. I had a, a postdoc in the US, and uh, uh, after a few years, I was lucky to, to, have, to be offered a lectureship, and I've sort of continued on. And uh, I've benefited from uh, a, num a number of sabbaticals, so it's, it's been very good. And um, I guess the reason that asked me to be here is that uh, we, uh, early, eight months ago, Martin Thomas were born, and uh, I guess we are an unconventional family in that. Uh, we were a same-sex couple, and uh, they were born in, in of course, unconventionally, they, they, were, they were born in the U.S., where we were on sabbatical, so that was, that was uh, convenient. And um, I guess I, I was amazed at the support that I received from the college, and, um, and I think it's important that we raise awareness to that. So uh, what that meant was that uh, in 2005, the U.K. Uh, introduced shared, parent, shared parental leave, that is compulsory. But the college has gone uh, over that and introduced enhanced shared parental leave, which meant that when they were born, we could both share the, the leave, which was uh, quite long, but also we could do that with no financial penalty, so we could both uh, retain our full salaries during that period. And uh, so they, they will be going to nursery in, um, uh, in March, and that, will, that will, would have meant that they would have stayed 10 months with us, which is really exceptional. Mm -hmm. and there are very few employers who would allow us to, to have done that. The other thing is that um, many of you will know about the, the L.C. Widdowson Fellowship. That's a fellowship that is essentially, I guess, intended to bring uh, generally mothers back from maternity leave and to get their careers sort of on track. There's, an, there's a realization from the college that once you go off on maternity leave and now on shared parental leave as well, that uh, you know, you will be a few months, maybe six months, maybe more, a, a whole year uh, out of work, and that there's a certain injection of uh, energy that can be that that 
can be your views. And so that this in LC Witterson Fellowship um, essentially enables the department to relieve the staff member from <coughs> admin and teaching duties and concentrate just on research. So that's, and uh, I guess I'm very grateful to m many of you probably here that HR made sure that uh, after shared parental leave was introduced that the rules for the LC Widowson Fellowship were also changed so that male applicants could also apply. And the process is very <coughs> rigorous. There's you submit a research plan and a number of things and I could benefit from that. So when I'll go back to work full time in March, I'll have uh, a year um, of my t teaching duties relieved so I can sort of, uh, I don't think that my career has been derailed in no way from having <laughs> Martin Thomas, very much in the country actually. I think it's, this is maybe a, a misconception that sometimes we need to clarify. I think if anything, it's made me uh, sort of better at uh, structuring my days, setting priorities, sort of getting things on track. So I think it's very much a, a uh, well, a blessing in so many ways, but including professionally. And uh, I, I feel that the, you know, every from, I, I, from the very beginning, when I spoke to, say, our HR rep in my department, or also my uh, line manager, the head of the department, I, the attitude from the college was, uh, from at all ranks, really, was one of uh, complete support and let's make this work. So in some ways, I feel that I've, uh, perhaps unlike some of us uh, in the panel, I've only, I guess, benefited from uh, making this family possible at the period where both the government and the college are incredibly, incredibly supportive of families. And I think it's important that we raise, so we celebrate this so that this keeps happening and uh, we, I guess, continue to nurture this. Support. I think it writes the timing, isn't it, as well? I think maybe 15 years ago we wouldn't be having this story. By all means, ask any questions. Um, I'm just quite interested. You've obviously had a really good experience with Imperial College, very, very supportive, and rightly so. In, in all honesty, for the rest of you, you're all supremely successful, obviously, but has there ever been any point where your difference, the reason that you're here on this panel today, has be, been a bit of an issue, or as you've noticed it being an issue, you've probably done a double take thinking, did that really happen? I mean, has that happened during your time here at Imperial, do you think, Mark? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be wrong if I said no. Um, I suppose part of it, and I can only really speak from an academic career, um, so that is full of sort of ebbs and flows. And so what happens is when you're in, uh, in that sort of, on that trajectory, uh, there's going to be ups and downs, but the issue is, I suppose, because I'm different in that respect, uh, when you have those, those, those challenging times, sometimes you have to ask yourself, is that happening because that's what happens on this trajectory, mm -hmm. or is that happening because it's me? Mm -hmm. And it's not always clear. Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, uh, I mean, I suppose if I... I Sorry, it sounds like I've got lots of examples, but I'm trying to think of a, 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 an apt uh, <laughs> example. Um, well, I, I suppose that, um, for example, while, when I was doing my PhD, uh, so as a PhD student, so I wasn't necessarily a staff member, but obviously still a, a part of the college community, uh, in my final year when I was writing up, unfortunately, my mum passed away. Um, so that obviously was a challenging time anyway. Uh, but at that particular point, and we are going back sort of in the late 90s, so, um, you know, things may well be a lot different, a lot different now. Um, but in, when that happened, um, there was a point where essentially my funding for my PhD had run out, but I still had to finish writing up. Um, there didn't seem to be much support. I didn't really even know much about how the academic career developed beyond the PhD. Um, so, in that sense, I just had to sort of think on my feet. In the end, I moved back to uh, Nottingham, which was my hometown for a couple of years, and then uh, an opportunity came up where I returned. But I think at that particular point, I can only compare it to maybe other situations where there's been other students who have actually been, if you like, given a heads up as to how to position themselves for the next stage in their career. Now, the question is, that does happen to some, and it doesn't happen to others. It didn't happen to me. Who knows why? Mm. But the point is, I don't dwell on those things too much. They're challenges that you have to overcome. So if I just see life as a series of challenges, then I'll deal with it yeah. wherever it may come from. Has any of the other of you had any challenges like that in your time here, specifically at Imperial? I, mean, I, I wouldn't say challenges. I was unbelievably, brilliantly supported by my line manager. 
So they were, I'm not going to name them, um, but they were really, really supportive. And I think the thing about being a carer is that it's quite, I think there are times if you're dealing with crisis, and so emergency phone calls, hospital, people around you, there's not, it's difficult for them to know what to say to you. Mm. Um, because I, because you can't sort of, you've got no spare capacity to sort of say, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I think one thing I would say to the whole audience is when someone who is a carer dealing with crisis is that when they say they're fine, they're actually, they're not fine. But don't sort of say, look, you're not really fine because they don't have that spare space to say, <laughs> okay, I'll tell you how I really am. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours later, this poor person sitting there going, oh, I really wish I had asked. Um, so, but I was really, really supported, um, very sensitively, very absolutely right for me. Um, there's a lot of support out there, um, but I think carers, I didn't take a lot of it because I just, I, I, I was too much in dealing with the crisis. But there is a lot, there is a lot there. So was it I, a difficult first conversation, the first time you sat down with someone and said, you need to know this is happening? Uh, yeah. There's people in this room that will not have known any of this, that I've known for about eight Thank years. Thank you for being so honest and frank then today. Yeah, you've just got to get that first conversation out, as presumably then you discover what's out there. Yeah. Has it been driven by you, or has it been driven by Imperial College, the support structure? Um, the support is there. So I think the fact that it is then that you could take it when you are able to, not when you need it, but when you're able to, the, the support is, is, I think it, it is really there. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it then goes back to the individual, because if you're caring for someone and it's in crisis, you you're dealing with that in front of you, not sort of thinking, actually, I could really do with getting a bit of support myself. Mm -hmm. So, but it is there. When your time comes, it is, it is all there. Okay. Sarah, did you have to build the, the support for people with dyslexia? Did, was that, that no, come from you a lot of it? No, it hasn't come from me at all. Yeah. It's come from the equality and diversity, um, people that have spent the last four years in, in developing um, support mechanisms um, for people that are more that are neurodivergent. So, um, yeah, and, and personally me, I haven't sort of sought any support because it's not something I ever discuss with people. It's not, you know, it's just because I've never had that label. I only got diagnosed recently, and the only reason I got diagnosed because all, everything about my son I could relate to and what he was going through. And also I felt important because I do a lot of outreach work and I wanted to know, you know, am I dyslexic? I, I sort of pretty much knew I was. And, but it's good to have that label to be able to sort of mention that, by the way, mm, that might be spelt wrong because I'm dyslexic. You know, when you're giving a lecture or doing something with young people, because I think it just sort of says, okay, you know, you've got that label, but it doesn't, it's not going to stop you. Do you think things would have been different a few, a few years ago for you? Ten years ago? Um, what, in, as in a in positive what, way? Yeah, in terms of what was out there for you. Um, well, I, I don't think there is anything out there. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it's only, literally, it's, this is the first year or so that the ah. college is offering support to people that you know have these sort of differences in in processing um does that make you how does that make you feel about the, the college is it just just one of those things or does that make obviously there are a, a number of people that might have gone might have gone through the system not knowing <coughs> that they might have reached out for a, a little bit of support yeah i mm. think i think it is and i think because you don't appreciate the how um, dyslexia can affect so many aspects of your life, um, you, yeah, I, I guess you sort of underestimate the impact it has on you. But, you know, I, I, I don't see it any different. You know, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses, and I think it's just like that, and you build on your strengths and try and cover up your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a strategy, isn't it? And that's, you know, we have a lot of students at Imperial that are very gifted, but they have, you know, learning, are neurodivergent. 
and it hasn't stopped them getting to Imperial, it won't stop them doing really well in their exams. And, but what's good to see is that those students now are being really well supported by our disability advisory group and they are being picked up and, and actively um, helped in the recruitment process to get jobs. So I think it's a, you know, it it's all looks really positive. Good. Good. And through people like you. Um, Jao, the, uh, there was a recent survey that said that academics are more likely to be LGBT than any other major profession that we have in the UK. That was a, that was a survey done by Stonewall that came up with those findings. Does that surprise you or is it is it an open arm type of profession? That's, I, I didn't see that, but I, I was surprised when I got recommended that we walked in and, and uh, passed by the, the, the entrance lobby where there's some diversity... Uh, sort of boards, and there was one that said that there was there was about one percent of uh, of uh, I think uh, LGBT. Is that is that correct in in the college? Well, and declared, I, declared. Yeah. declared exactly. I I I, I, don't, I really am not very versed in in the, those kinds of studies. I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lack of real academic rigor in in these kinds of state statements. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, from my own experience, um, I don't see. In fact, I, I don't see a correlation. Um, between the two at all, but I guess if I look in, in science, I do have a number of uh, LGBT colleagues and friends, many of them who I respect um, you know, very highly, and most perhaps are uh, perhaps uh, uh, not openly um, LGBT, and I think for, this is perhaps what made me, um, I guess, realize that at this point where the, the, the conditions, that people behind us have made the conditions so favorable to, for example, make a family possible, that, there, that I had uh, an additional responsibility to, towards our students, for example. So I was a, a warden for many years as a, a college resident here for uh, eight years, and I was admissions tutor for many years. I've been teaching it for, for 10 years. And I think there are so many students coming through who are LGBT or are perhaps maturing, uh, and, and that I, I think that I, I kind of owe them to them, just that so many people had done so much work for me before to make that more visible. So, in I guess in short, I I don't know if there's a correlation uh, mm -hmm. between the two, but I certainly think that those of us who are who are and have benefited so much from the the, the work that has happened before have a responsibility to be you know discreetly visible. Not to make, I certainly don't want to make that one of my uh, sort of defining features because it's never been, and I continue to be a, you know very focused on my research career and now on my family. But I think I kind of kind of force myself uh, to become more visible because I think I have that sort of gratitude towards the college and sort of more broadly towards sort of people behind me. Do you think that, Shani, do, do you think that people have preconceptions about you? I did uh, an interview uh, six months ago with a, a world-leading brilliant tailor. She's an Asian female and she's utterly brilliant. Um, and uh, she wanted to do men's tailoring. And all through her career, even now, she's been, she's been awarded an OBE. You know, she, she, she's utterly, astonishingly talented. And even now, she goes and gives lectures. And, and the assumption is that she's sitting at home still sewing up saris and stuff. <laughs> and she goes, no, I, I, I did the prime minister suit. I'm, I'm a, uh, I do men's tailoring. And they just yeah. cannot get their heads around it. And she just quietly gets on with it, you know. But God, how annoying. Does that happen to you? Yeah. So I, I concur entirely. I think one of the things about skin colour is it's one of the it's a difference that's very visible, and unfortunately, it then I think maybe it's something that happens more in Britain than anywhere else in the world, but it happens in other places too. We tend to define people by what we see, so people will remember me as you know the Asian one or yeah, and, and you you know that because they'll then call you by somebody else's name who happens to be somebody else they know who's Asian. <laughs> they go, oh God, I'm so sorry. Yep, uh, I know that one. Just used to that. That's kind of yeah. I'm, I'm so used to that. But they do make uh, preconception. They have preconceptions. I mean, from the, from the silly things like when you know, when I was at school expecting me to come to school on an international day wearing a sari, whereas my mother had never you know wasn't wasn't somebody who wore a sari. Uh, to um, I mean, amusingly, being asked, uh, my, my husband is, is a practicing Catholic, and being phoned up and having a phone message uh, left about the international mass at the local church, and maybe your wife could come and do the bidding prayer in her native tongue. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, what is my native tongue? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, 
and, and there is a, you know, even, you know, sort of, there is also a preconception about the educated Asian woman, which is a pejorative yes. term that I have heard on numerous occasions by people. They, did, they, meant, they didn't mean, I think, to be pejorative, but it is a hugely pejorative term. The implication being that, because otherwise you shouldn't be educated. Mm. The subject is, you know, why would you be educated? So I need to add that adjective in front of the word Asian woman. So I guess as the partner to your tailoring lady who's sewing up saris at home, you have the educated Asian woman yeah. who might be a bit irritating and a bit annoying because she is educated and not busy at home sewing up saris as she should be. Yeah. I don't know, but it's, there, yeah. there are these preconceptions and people do tend to see bio colour. It's a shame. It would be good to change those, those preconceptions. I mean, I know someone who, who's on television, the amount of times I get stopped <coughs> and asked if I'm the doctor. You're doc oh, you're my doctor, aren't you? You're the doctor. Oh, yeah. some, you know, they kind of know me and they, so, uh, they know me and she must be in medicine, so for Noah, because that's what they do, isn't it? You know, they go to, <laughs> And I'd love to be able to say, yes, I'm in fact a surgeon, but I'm not. I'm just a woman on the telly. You know, I'm really sorry. So, and and, and it, I, I try not to get annoyed, but it annoys me. I just can't help it. It annoys me. And you were talking earlier, Mark, about it just being, it, it, which surprised me really, that it just being that much more forward in the States, which you know about how it works and academia um, and stuff well, in America. Well, I was, yeah, mainly contrasting certain approaches, um, I suppose. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited on a, a visitor's program to the States uh, a couple of years ago and I met lots of um, African-Americans who were in prominent positions, particularly in the STEM areas uh, of science, uh, technology and so on. Um, and just the, the, the difference in terms of how, how they recognise each other. So, for example, um, I met Dr. Shirley Ann, uh, uh, Dr. Shirley Ann Williams, actually. Sorry, Jackson. I get her name right. She, she was, uh, she's the lead... She's the head of the Resonant Polytechnic Institute, a uh, very respected um, research-based sort of university in the, in the States, as well as being on the board of many companies, FedEx, Microsoft, and so on. Um, uh, but she was the first uh, African-American female to get a PhD in physics at Harvard. Now, the thing is, that's just an example. It's just a, a sort of a throwaway fact. But you can virtually go to any university, and they will tell you who was the first African-American to do this particular thing, when they did it, and what's the legacy as a result. Now, if I compare and contrast that to when we, um, a few, quite a few years ago, when we had the Imperial Centenary in 2007. And at the time, um, we, we, I was very, quite active in the, in the group Imperial as one. And we wanted to, at the time, wanted to do, if you like, recognition of all the contributions, the BME contributions to, to, to science at Imperial over the, the, the hundred years that it had been in existence. And when we tried to get information from the archives, even though there were pictures there of people, they didn't really have any real records sort of before 1960. So it's almost like they didn't, it's, it's almost like institutionally, and I'm not blaming any individual, but institutionally we, we don't see those sorts of records as important. So there is an issue of whose responsibility is it to document, because actually they are important. Um, you know, one quick example before I move, you know, I move on is... Um, Whilst I was out in the States, the most cited black professor in the States at the time was somebody called Clifford Johnson, who's a string theorist, and he's won lots of medals and awards in, in theoretical physics, and he's at UCLA. Um, now, it's only when I went out there that I discovered that he actually was a graduate of my department. Uh, so, again, I suppose we might as well call it institutional amnesia. That's what it feels like, okay? You go to a place, so if I, when I was a PhD student, if I knew of the existence of Clifford Johnson then, uh, then I probably wouldn't have just thought, okay, I recognize I'm the only one, but I wouldn't have thought I'm the first one. I would have known that whatever I achieve has been achieved before. So there is some responsibility. I'm not sure where it lies, that if we, you know, we have to keep the legacy, otherwise we will forget that even I or anyone else existed, and so we have to reinvent the wheel again. So that's what I'm keen to try and do, to keep that legacy so that we don't forget. And that's something we could learn from the States in that respect. There's other things we don't need to learn, but that's something we can. <laughs> 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 Brick building. Please just raise your hand. If anyone's got any questions, please just, just raise your hand and ask a question. So you've, you've touched on it there a little bit. What do you think, hand on heart, Imperial actually could do better? What could, what could it do better? We're having events like this, we're talking about it. You're, you know, you just making that statement there, Mark, that's, that will have had an impact. Um, what other things do we need to do better um, to feel like 
you're just kind of reaching out and helping people that are coming through after you. I mean, do, do you know other people, Liz, who, might, who are in a similar sort of situation to you within the university? Um, I don't. You don't. <laughs> you know, but there may well be. know about me. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think it is the... I, it's, that's a really difficult question because I think the college has been great and have been really um, supportive. But it is, you know, it is the, the the mental health thing is a thing that we will not talk about. So, um, if, you know, someone goes off and they're ill and they, you know, if they've broken their leg, they've got cancer or anything. That's that's openly s spoken about. Um, but if it's anything mental health, it's just like oh, that they're, they're ill. And I think one of the reasons why I didn't talk about the caring of Donald, my husband, is because he's got mental health issues. Um, so I think one thing the college do, and I think they are going there, but there's society we've got a long way to go, is actually that it's perfectly okay. Mental health, physical health, cancer, mental health, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. It's they're all of equal standing. But, you know, we know this with the medical profession that, you know, you break a leg, it's going to be fixed in six, six weeks. And um, mental health, years, you know. Um, so... I think the I think it's more not so much the college and the college is really good, but it's just the society that it should be perfectly all right to say, I I care again I care for someone with mental health issues, and that has an impact on me, um, in terms of um, stress levels and things, um, and I think just maybe a high, you know some. It's a, it's a catch, I mean, actually, I would say, it's a catch-22, so I don't want people to be fragile with me. But at the same time, I, I've been here when I've, the day before, I've been in a crisis meeting in the hospital. I'm not saying anything because it's not appropriate. So are we looking at maybe it's, it is okay for it to be appropriate? I don't know. That's, that's actually up for, I think that's up for discussion. Mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you wish you talked to more people? Mm, it's, mm. it's tricky, isn't that one, isn't no, it? I don't, I'm, ooh, okay. I don't know, actually. Well, I am now. I've got the talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I've, 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 I've uh, what is it come out? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I I think we are missing an opportunity if we don't actively encourage more um, students. So at school to come to Imperial, the ones that are neurodivergent, because these are the people there. Their strengths very much align with what people now um, term 21st century job skills. So you're looking, you're not, you know, we, we've gone past knowledge being everything. We're now moving into an era where, you know, creativity and innovation, entrepreneurship, things that are really valued. And this is something that I think somebody, certainly people that are dyslexic, will bring to. Um, a workplace and so I think we want to actively recruit those people um, into our workforce and into you know our student community so I think we want to be more open more transparent about the fact that we want we, we value the contribution that these people can bring to the college what ways could Imperial do that well I think this is a, a start isn't it and having, you know, they are putting things in place gradually, and I think it will sort of snowball. One of the things that I, I'm doing is to develop um, workshops for pupils that are um, have a learning that are gifted, but have a learning disability, and to bring them into Imperial to teach them strategies for learning because because they process in a different way, they learn in a very different way. Um, and and to try and inspire them and show them that you know it is possible. So that's something um, with schooling. I think in uh, for our students we need to teach um, adopt more inclusive teaching practices. Um, so teach in a way that is good for because you know it's estimated that at least fifteen percent of people have. Uh, dyslexia and people have other forms of um, learning difficulties as well. Yeah, I, I, and I saw statistics saying there's seven million uh, people with disabilities of working age in the UK right now. It'd be, it'd be interesting to know how many of them are actually working mm. and in employment or you know mm. in training or further education. 
Um, there's also, I, I've got loads of statistics today, I'm a journalist, <laughs> we just, <laughs> you know, um, that um, a recent survey by the um, Higher Education Statistics Agency, of which, which I mentioned earlier, stated that um, of the 500 or so institutions that took place, there are no non-white um, senior managers in higher education in universities. This is directors and uh, senior managers and uh, officials, and uh, th there are none, uh, and that's been the case for the last three years, uh, which is a really horrible statistic, isn't it? Does that surprise anybody? But surely it reflects... I mean, if you're talking about some um, academic administrators... Yeah, I mean, uh, this, I mean they, they describe um, senior managers as managers, directors, and senior officials. This is how the... What, mm. I mean, it's, it's, I guess... It, it, I mean, certainly in academia, that would not be surprising because you've seen the statistics for, um, uh, for ethnic origin and different levels within academia. There is a, uh, a disproportionate, uh, uh, you know, disproportionately low number of black and ethnic minority uh, people within senior faculty within the UK in general. So if that's the sort of managerial um, uh, position that you're referring to, then it reflects that. But on the other hand, if you're referring to the um, uh, professional services uh, managerial structure, then that, that is, is more of an issue because I would imagine that uh, there, I don't know what the data are uh, in the sort of the, the pyramid of, of um, the, the structures there, but that would be alarming, equally alarming. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't surprise me on the one hand because I think the university to a large extent is a reflection of society. So if we were to take you know, the, the, the cabinet office or the FTSE 100 directors, you'd probably get a similar distribution and of a similar, you know. So, so in that sense, you know, universities are reflecting to some extent uh, what, what the society over here appears to reflect. Uh, but on the other hand, if we think of what the business of universities and we look at it at the student level, then the student level is usually extremely diverse. Mm -hmm. So one has to ask the question, what happens? Is there some sort of filtering processes? Uh, you know, why do we not? We have lots of, let's say, uh, Chinese or Southeast Asian students, but yet how many are actually represented at the very top of the institution? So that's what we probably have to be careful of to say, are we doing enough to make sure that the playing field is still open beyond uh, undergraduate level uh, and, and career-wise uh, in that respect. But, um, yeah. So that's the bit that, that I suppose is surprising, but not the result as it stands, because I think it's reflection of, of most sort of organisations, I'm afraid. It's sad, but it, it's, it's a reality. Mm. We've got any students here? <coughs> well, I'll pick on you then. <laughs> <laughs> Off you go. Um, so uh, so what, what are, you, are you hoping to, you know... Um, could stay in the world of, of, of academia. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts? Do you, are you confident that there's openings for you, possibilities, encouragement, equality? Um, in terms of academia, I'll be totally honest. I'm not really that fond of school. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I go to school. I get my my specialisation. I go back and I work. So I would I'm not really interested in staying in academia. I have looked into it, um, so I don't even know what the whole landscape is like. Have you been surprised by anything you've heard today, or? Um, no. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, no. I mean, this. Look at the. You're you're amazingly diverse. All sitting here. Um, have any of you been sort of surprised, or any any of you know areas in which Imperial might improve? You know, to 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 perhaps offer more support, talk more about situations that perhaps Sarah or Liz are in, or Jow, or I mean. I think media should go to start to go to schools and bring out the best. I was in the industry in the engineering when I was five years old. I met Sarah. So, uh, in fact, uh, Royal, uh, Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, it was one time a chairman of uh, 2010, said that you must go to school at the age of five, bring them into engineering. Mm -hmm. So what my late father did uh, 40, 50 years ago, the university has to do now. Well, I, th I think that's something very close to the heart here. <laughs> There's obviously a heck of a lot of work going on here, which I know about here at Imperial, in doing exactly that, you know. Um, any, anybody else, any other areas that you feel? 
Yuri, if I can comment on yeah, of course. something you mentioned. I, I find, uh, I mentioned to you, I think, I was an admissions tutor for four years. And so that, uh, I think we, we spoke with Mark earlier. And that's important because I ended up going to very good schools and private schools, but also, you know, a whole range of different schools. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we have definitely that responsibility that you, that you mentioned in bringing everyone the best, in fact, to Imperial. But he, for example, in my case, uh, and I think the case of many of us, where we perhaps we have special circumstances that would uh, we would like to raise awareness of, but uh, whether we are unsure about the appropriateness of, uh, uh, of um, for example, uh, explaining that Imperial will be a very welcoming place for people with all different backgrounds. So uh, I think from everyone, I would appreciate, say, advice on what. Um, for example, the, the the fact that you know Imperial has been so supportive of uh, you know uh, 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 an academic with the same sex same sex relationship mm. with a family, etc., and that that if that is the kind of place, not necessarily because the the student, the prospective uh, aspiring applicant is LGBT him or herself, but because that's the kind of environment where they think, uh, yeah, I can see myself in an environment that is welcoming of everyone, and and so I think collectively we're not. Uh, I don't think we have a. Ah! Certainly, re I certainly haven't reflected enough on what should I be uh, sort of either openly or sort of discreetly in conversation mm. or in a presentation, making others aware that uh, you know, in many ways, we're such a good place that would uh, would uh, nurture their development if they were to come and study with us. So I wonder if anyone has ideas. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I think you want a tagline: science doesn't discriminate. Mm. Mm. Because people, when you are a scientist. People are looking at your output, what you've done, your research, um, not whether you're a woman or black or, or whatever. And I, I really um, found that when I went to one of the school's events, and it was a, the, it was a national competition, science competition, and talking to some of the people that had, had won um, awards and things, and, and they had said that to me. They had said, or said, you know, this is the one place that they could come, and they were being just valued on what they had produced. Sorry, was that a, a student or a, a the students senior? that were in this competition for a science competition? I mean, I'd love to say science doesn't discriminate, um, and you know, in terms of the body of knowledge, it doesn't discriminate. You know, uh, two plus two is four, whatever colour background you are. So in that sense, it doesn't discriminate. I suppose at this stage, we probably should say science shouldn't discriminate yeah. because <laughs> career-wise, it may well do. And mm. if we say it doesn't discriminate, then what we're saying is those who reflect the very best of science at the top, it's all down to the fact of, of, of uh, well, let me put it another way. Those at the very top is a reflection of the demographics that are the best at that particular thing. But when we're also arguing, well, no, actually, there are lots of women, there are lots of people from other backgrounds who are, you know, who can contribute just as much as, 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 as other, you know, the standard. So to me, I think if we was to say science doesn't discriminate, that could almost look like we're endorsing the status quo. I think we need mm. to change the status quo so we can say it doesn't discriminate and we actually have the evidence to show it doesn't discriminate. At the moment, it doesn't reflect society at large in terms of the upper echelons of science. Uh, and you know, in some areas, even in the student body, there's underrepresentation. So at this stage, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable saying science doesn't discriminate. But I agree that it shouldn't discriminate. And it's not beneficial to discriminate. I think, you know, say my industry is, is, is just as bad. We, we've barely got, to, we've sort of got to this stage. You know, maybe in 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years' time, we won't need to have panels and talk about it, but we are definitely not at that stage yet. Even somewhere as, as great and as, as, as Imperial clearly is doing great things and making great strides in talking about diversity, but we're all a long way off, I think, aren't we, from, from it becoming not even a thing. Not even a thing, you know, we don't, we don't talk about it at all. So, and, uh, interestingly, anybody here today... Who, who has experienced some form of discrimination because they're different, in all honesty, in their time here? Actually, I was not discriminated, but I think uh, the best student from my class, from Ghana, 
Is it you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the best student in my class has got a hand up. Very modest of her. <laughs> Are you listening, children? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great message, isn't it? So, um, so I think it's 1 30. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So, I, I have a question. So, um, in the medical school, as Charlie points out, we, we have a problem. We have virtually zero BME students. Our outreach programs need BME students. It looks like they're going to apply. And then they fall away as they come up for application. So they fall away because they don't jump the A level hurdle, or they don't jump the BMAT hurdle, or for whatever reason they just don't decide to stay. And if we ask them, I think the point they use is, is, is they just don't feel they have sufficient social capital to get it into this place and enjoy being here. Because there is so much about the way they live that for many of them feels so alien to the way they live but the two just don't come together. So bridging that gap, for me, seems to be one of the most mm. important things. And I, I, I mean, we're, we're considering a year zero school, you know, a place where you can come and you can you know, improve your, your grades, but you can also have some, some sense that socially you can manage this environment, because I think it's a very scary environment. Yeah. That's, that's and really and Kings have adopted that, haven't they? Kings, mm -hmm. Kings have got that year zero for particularly for those students, um, and it seems to be working. So, yeah. If I if I can comment on that as well, for, as admissions student for a, uh, you know a bunch of years at uh, chemical engineering, we, I also felt and my colleagues be after and before me felt very strongly about uh, widening participation and having a really a strategy for admissions that was inclusive. And uh, that really made sure, sort of altru selfishly, that we would bring in the best people to Imperial and altruistically that we, would, we were doing the right thing. I think ethically that would be the right thing. And one thing we've noticed is that one, once, you know, that the strategy of, say, relaxing admission requirements in some way was definitely an ineffective, as uh, students who were admitted were often felt disengaged, felt didn't feel supported by the institution, didn't feel well integrated. And so we realized that, well, clearly that's not a viable strategy. And perhaps uh, one that uh, I think would be more viable, although it requires more resources, would be in once admitting students with, uh, from a, a more sort of varied background to support them within the department. Uh, with uh, mentorship pro programs, whether with staff or with students, with additional classes. But it's very difficult, of course, to, to do this without discriminating the student, without making them feel uh, that they're perhaps less worthy than other students. But it's certainly something that I don't, I don't think, at least this, the people I've met so far, we have given it enough thought to come up with a viable strategy. It's about role models, mentors. Is that, is that the key in every industry? It certainly is in mine. I know that. I think there's a, there's a little there's a need for a little bit more of a push because these there are strict academic milestones that need to be met during the for example first year and if they're not met they could alienate the student that actually undermine their confidence for you know later on so we wouldn't be doing anyone a service so just having the role model is well, it's very important but it is certainly not sufficient. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but yes, good points in terms of role models and such. Um, but one thing else, uh, comment on if you're an international student, coming to Imperial is not cheap. So, in terms of funding, that's one of the issues that um, international students will have. One thing I'll comment in Imperial I'm doing is that scholarship search tool that they have on the website that is actually really helpful in terms of international students trying out different scholarships that you're eligible for. Um, I'm not sure how much in detail it goes. I know there are some countries internationally that will have their own local scholarships. So in terms of pushing students, they have the brains to come here. Um, they love to have role models, but in terms of getting the funding, I like how Imperial has started it. But I don't know if there's any kind of interaction with these with these countries in terms of saying, All right, these are some local scholarships that you could apply for. So that's a bit more in depth than what it is now, but I don't know if it's an expert. Yeah, I think I just want to add to that in terms of, um, I mean, there is a natural adjustment you've got to make when you come here from school normally to university. So there's that adjustment academically and, and socially to some extent. Um, but again, um, if we're trying to widen access, 
So you're going to have, um, you're trying to obviously include more people from maybe um, uh, economically, sort of socially uh, underrepresented groups who may have low, sort of relatively low social economic um, um, standing, so to speak. Then there's that adjustment, which is a hidden adjustment. I've, I've spoken to students just as part of my, you know, sort of general uh, work where they've been on previous outreach programs and they've done, in a sense, they've done the hard thing, they've actually got here. But then there's still this adjustment to make. I had one student, for example, who uh, basically was seen as not being very sociable because he was always refusing to sort of, you know, do a lot of these social things because of the financial constraints. There's also other issues in terms of there's a lot of pressure for students uh, who are very good and very bright and might even be interested in a PhD to actually get a job because of family pressures to start earning. So these are things which I suppose is hidden where they, they may well suffer in silence and the university may not be as aware because many of them, many of them do. So I think that we, we probably can, if we're from trying to pick, I think the university does a great job, but I think we can probably do more in terms of looking at Things like bursaries, not just for, you know, for, for, for students who are, who are financially challenged, because you don't want finance to be the thing that stops a student from fulfilling their potential. So I think, generally, we could do more about that. Um, as for how feasible that is, that's a, another story. Uh, and I give you a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest to you, talent spot youngsters in your career. Find out after 10 years, what they are doing. That's absolutely fine. I understand that, that they I will be done, earning. I, 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 I have myself done it. I tell it, so, so that my nephew, when he was 20 years old, his father wanted him to be a doctor. I said, no, he's going to do engineering. <laughs> <laughs> and he did PhD in Caltech. And on the way he came here, I told him you, you specialize in structural dynamics. Right. And then he was transported by a mechanical engineer to be a car industry. From there, he moved the events. Sure. And he said, bought by the United States government. Last year, as a top scientist. There's no doubt that a PhD does a lot, you know, to, to prepare you, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I bear testament to that. Uh, but, but all I want to say there is that if someone is suffering right now and you say, well, in 10 years' time you're going to be, you know, very comfortable, that only carries so much weight at the time when you need the help. So that's the thing I say we should recognise. We'll just take one more question if we can, just before we finish. Thank you. It's not really a question, it's more um, a remark. Okay. I am And I, I wanted to say, you, you may want to have also people sitting who think of themselves they are not part of the diversity. Because for me, one big experience was, was to discover that I had a problem with religion. And I would never have thought that. I was raised, I think, by parents who made it. But for them, it was very important for me to be open. And when I studied in Germany, I, went, I studied the history of science. And I had an, a professor who was uh, from the <coughs> theological uh, faculty, and I thought, how can you be from the theological faculty and be a professor? This doesn't matter, because if you have a religion, you don't teach at the university. And it went worse when I studied one year in Cameroon, and I had um, a sociology professor who was a priest. And I was like, this really doesn't match. You can't be a priest and you can't be a self service professor. <laughs> and it went, you know, here I was working for a bank in, in the UK, in London, and I had a manager who was sick and um, in France. I, I may have had a manager who was sick, but I wouldn't have known that because you leave your religion at home. So this whole story of you know, at some point I discovered, oh, I might have a problem with, you know, it's going to be short now, but, you know, for me, I think at the beginning, being intelligent and having a religion was not something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's not, as, I don't know who said, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not an aggression, but you, you, you need to, I was put in situation in my life. Where I, where I had to recognize that, and I am intelligent. I can, I can, I can talk to people. I can get to that point, but I need to be in situation where I get to that point. And I think this is really much what we have to work on. Because when I see what, for example, in France, we we, we, we do have a problem with, you know, I, I don't think you would, you would have a Muslim sitting here, because I think Muslim in France is. 
I don't mm. even know how you can surmise that. Interesting point, actually. Interesting point. Especially today. Speaking as an intelligence seek, is what, which is what I am. <laughs> 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 okay, intelligence seek. <laughs> you know, I, I want to thank you for coming along today and sharing this so charmingly. Uh, I also want to thank our panel thank very much. This is our first diverse week as Imperial. And we've never done a panel like this before, so I think our panel were quite courageous in accepting my invitation. Um, and of course, Martha and Thomas were the stars of it. <laughs> <laughs> the best behaved babies yeah, in the yeah. world. <laughs> but I also think that we've talked about some quite difficult issues. Uh, these are issues that are present now, they're not going to go away, we have to find ways to tackle them. We've started to tackle some of them, but it's very clear from the things we've heard, we've got a long way to go with a lot of them. And that's what diversity in period is all about, is to try to surface some of these issues so that we can start to address them more carefully. It's very good to have heard some of the very positive things that the, the college is doing. You are my superstar, Elsie Willison Fellow. Um, <laughs> we'll be duly embarrassed about it for the next 20 years. <laughs> but I think the panel have been very yeah. courageous in coming here today, and I'd like to thank you all very, very much on behalf of us all. Thank you.